Let me tell you how bad it is. There are now Asian Americans that are wearing GoPro cameras on their baseball caps when they're out in public in case this happens so they can film it. I'm Essence Zafar, and welcome to another episode of Unfair Nation, the podcast that discusses our nation's rising inequity and social, political, and economic inequality, what it means for you, and what you can do about it. Every other week, we interview one person to get their perspective on structural inequality, and today I'm joined by Dr. Errol Southers, a professor in Los Angeles, California. There is absolutely no place for the discrimination and hate crimes that we are seeing across this country and even in this region. That's Eric Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, talking about the rising discrimination against Asian Americans that started happening in the wake of this coronavirus pandemic. It's unfortunate. And our guest today is going to talk to us about this phenomenon, what you can do if you are a victim of this phenomenon, how you can get empowered. And if you are witnessing this phenomenon or know somebody who has been harassed or assaulted on the basis of their ethnic identity and some uh, relation to the coronavirus, which doesn't exist, uh, what you can do to help that person. His name's Dr. Errol Southers, uh, our guest tonight, and he has done kind of everything. He started at Brown University, then went to medical school, then decided that he wanted to join law enforcement, so he quit, came to Santa Monica, California, and became a dock catcher, the Santa Monica Police Department, and then decided, you know what, let me go to the FBI. Did that for a little bit, joined the LA County Museum of Art, uh, then ran security at Los Angeles International Airport, LAX, joined Governor Schwarzenegger's administration, as if all that was not enough, decided, you know what, now I wanna get my doctorate, and teach, which is what he does now. He teaches at the University of Southern California's Sol Price School of Public Policy, and uh, he also runs the Safe Communities Institute there. So very happy and glad to have Dr. Souther joining us. Dr. Souther's. Yeah, I sound like I'm in in a studio now. Yeah, you you are. You're in a virtual studio. Well, thanks for being here. You're too kind. First of all, you and I have done this act many <laughs> times before. Yeah. I think we I think we should take this on the road. We should we did. We did. We took it on the road. New York. That's true. Yeah. That's true. We've done, we we need to re we need to restart that process. Yeah. Once the country opens again, we'll go on the road again or we can go on the road virtually. We we really should think about that. I've been I've been yeah. listening to your price uh, talks. Uh, okay. Which have been which have been great. Uh, the one that the one Thank that you, you did, and then um, where you talked about the virus of hate, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I'm gonna have done a little intro of yours, you know, before okay. before this, so people will kind of know. I'm I'm basically gonna say, you know, what has this man not done? Uh, <laughs> he's, he's he's been a dog <laughs> catcher. He went to Brown University. <laughs> he no he so hold on. He went to Brown University. Then he became a dog catcher uh, after, going to, medical after going to medical school. And then he decided, <laughs> why not join the FBI? That would be nice. Uh, <laughs> then he decided to work for, uh, I can't even keep track. Then you worked for the Los Angeles County Museum. Then you worked for, for the years. Airport Authority. Then you worked for Governor Schwarzenegger. Then mm-hmm. you decided, uh, you know, let me try TSA. You know, that didn't, that didn't work out. No fault of your own. And then he said, you know what? What's left? Let me... Uh, let me become a professor. Uh, let me get my doctorate while I'm at it uh, and start a center. Um, and so oh boy. that's kind of where you are now. And, uh, and uh, you know, you're just getting started. I, I still have a lot to do. So, Errol, tell me about the virus of hate. That's kind of what you've been calling this phenomenon of the rise of discrimination against Asian American communities in particular due to the coronavirus. What, what, what do you mean when you say the virus of hate? 
Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on today. I really appreciate that. Um, I don't take these opportunities lightly. And and secondly, I want to say that the virus of hate comes out of an article that I did uh, early in, uh, in April where I talked about how extremists are viewing this COVID-19 as an opportunity. It's a time when all of us are focused on the global pandemic. They are focused on recruitment, radicalization, furthering their cause, and growing their numbers. And in doing so, what's happened now is they become more and more engaged, meaning these extremist organizations, they've actually been engaging in activities across the country, targeting Asian Americans, targeting, targeting immigrants in acts of, if you will, um, shunning uh, actual violence mm-hmm. and, and other incidents um, under the guise of, um, again, pushing their agenda. So this, if you will, hashtag virus of hate came out of us trying to focus on making people better educated and more aware about their personal safety and some of the things that are going on as we are trying to face a global pandemic. You know, when we talk about home global extremists, we're talking about three different streams of ideology. We're talking about those that are racially motivated, those that are motivated by religion, and those that are both motivated by issue orientation. By the issue-oriented groups, I talk about those who are engaged in anti-immigrant activities, um, anti-gay, anti-Muslim, it's sort of the anti-category, if you will, anti-government. And needless to say, and unfortunately, there are hybrids of these strains of extremist ideologies as well. And we see that, unfortunately, increasingly more often. Well, I I do like the fact that you added the hashtag to the virus of hate. Uh, You're quite a prolific tweeter. What's your Twitter (laughs) handle, uh, Dr. Southers? My Twitter handle is uh, E-SouthersHVE, and the HVE stands for Homegrown Violent Extremism. I learn how to how to tweet every day from you. <laughs> I'm not nearly as good as some people, that's for sure. And is this part of a wider phenomenon? You talked about HVE. How far back does this go? Well, it's interesting you should ask that question. Um, HVE goes back as far as, uh, let's just say at least decades. We have in the United States been in a state of denial about HVE. And when I say HVE, I'm basically talking about, again, homegrown violent extremists, where you've got essentially a terrorist act within the context of ideologically motivated violence or plots. So when I talk about American HVEs, I'm talking about those American citizens, residents, or visitors who embrace their ideology largely within the United States. So if we want to go back just a couple of decades, we can talk about Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh being a veteran, not having any you know foreign training or, or any influence of an international terrorist organization, you know, he engaged his ideology, which was largely anti-government here in the United States, and acted out. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about the context of HVE. It's been happening for some time. Uh, we, of course, as the United States got into this quote-unquote global war on terror after 9-11, we focused almost exclusively on those organizations internationally that were uh, based uh, overseas and, and focused on, it, on the Muslim religion, the Islamic religion, and lost sight of the growing numbers of groups within our borders here domestically that were opposed to the government, that were opposed to immigrants and people of color Despite the increasing numbers, we stayed focused on that international threat because, quite frankly, I believe we were in a state of denial, refusing to believe that Americans can kill other Americans because of some extremist ideology. And we were very, very wrong about that. Do you think that trend's growing, the kind of domestic uh, extremism? I think that trend, well, the the numbers are what they are. And and as you know, as we said this before, in the famous words of data scientist W. Edwards Deming, you know, without data, you're just somebody with an opinion. And so if we look at the numbers, if we look at the facts, you know, since 9-11, there's been an incredible uptick in what I'll call non-jihadist attacks here in the United States. Uh, 
those attacks have been increasing with, with frequency, and they've been increasing in severity. So in the last 10 years, more than 75% of the quote-unquote domestic terror attacks on Americans have been perpetrated by people on the far right. So why, why is that increase happening? Well, one of the reasons that increase is happening is because about a decade ago, there was a demographic statistic projection that America would become a minority-majority nation by 2050, 2050. And when I visited some of those extremist websites, particularly those on the right, some were neo-Nazi sites like the National Socialist Movement and others, when I visited their sites, some of them actually had a time clock ticking down by years, months, and days to how many were left before the year 2050 would arrive, and that's how much time they had. In the last several years, that projection has been updated that we will become a minority-majority nation by 2045. Can you explain that majority-minority for those that may not know? That means that we will become a country where largely people who people of color uh, who have largely been categorized as minorities in America will become the majority demographic mm-hmm. in this country. What we're seeing now is, are some activities by people that we call accelerationists, And those accelerationists have taken up an offensive position where they are no longer deeming that it's necessary to defend and protect the white race. It is now more appropriate and prudent to accelerate attacks against those who are of non-white races so that they can either, through fear, leave this country or cease to desist. Uh, We saw an incredible uptick in this activity after the Charlottesville incident right. in 2017. Right. So it's, it's gaining more traction. So how is this tied to responses to the coronavirus, bad responses, you know, maladaptive responses like hatred and stereotyping? Well, one of the biggest problems we have with coronavirus is its source. And as recently as today, I understand the director of national intelligence is, is, is actually stating that the source of this virus is from China. Um, I'm hearing people in the intelligence community say there are two things that are quite interesting about that is that we haven't seen any data to support that claim, although it may be true. Uh, and it's, uh, it's highly unusual for the director of national intelligence to make such a statement. So I've heard analogies this morning comparing to this statement to some of the allegations that were made when we had weapons of mass destruction allegedly in Iraq. And so there's some skepticism here. That coupled with the president stating that this was a Chinese virus has really exacerbated this situation. You know, we've had other pandemics and other illness-related issues in the United States, SARS, um, Ebola around the world. You know, we don't call it the Africa. We had MERS, right, which was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And you would expect, if anything— that that would result in discrimination against an already discriminated against population, which is Arab Americans, for instance, in the U.S. Certainly. But what's really interesting is that in calling this the Chinese virus or, you know, in the Chinese flu, and then as he typically does, doubling down when challenged and being requested to not do this, it fuels the base, it fuels the anti-immigrant sentiment, and of course, and unfortunately, it fuels incidents of harassment and violent behavior. So are you saying it's fueling those pre-existing populations of either HVE or affiliated HVE folks that you talked about? Is that is that what's happening? Or is this just kind of a generalized response? No, absolutely. It's fueling those organizations. Uh, you can see around the country when you look at some of the placards that are being uh, displayed when they're at demonstrations. Uh, we've had numerous incidents involving Asian Americans where they have been, uh, as they've been verbally assaulted by these people, they say things like, you know, Trump is right uh, and, and allude to the president mm-hmm. being the cause of their or their source of their information. So this is absolutely fueling the HVE movement in the United States. So you're saying it's an organized response, you know, that the, it's not kind of happenstance or disorganized. There's kind of some organized response against Asian Americans. It's as organized as these people have embraced his rhetoric 
and decided to further it in acts of verbal or physical assault. And what is that? What what is that looking like? Uh, yeah, my understanding is that you've heard of specific incidents that that are highlighting this unfortunate trend. Well, let's talk about the overall trend. Um, the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council has an online reporting center that they stood up on March 19th. Right. And in the first week, they had 670 complaints. Now, those are complaints of verbal harassment, shunning, and physical assault. In the second week, they totaled 1,100 complaints. They're averaging 100 complaints a day. And as you and I both know, wow. complaints particularly that are attached to or have a nexus to hate crimes are grossly underreported. Correct. And so the, the really chilling element of that is that 32% of those complaints nationwide occurred in California. So that's particularly disturbing, and they're taking place most often in grocery stores, pharmacies, and big box retail outlets that we all go to when we buy, you know, those items that people tend to hoard. Um, and that's where they're happening. I imagine, I don't know if you've read the, the, the complaints themselves, but I'm assuming that these are kind of direct kind of harassment and not even indirect harassment or discrimination, right? For instance, we're seeing with African-American populations where they are not directly being turned away from getting mm-hmm. coronavirus-related relief at, at medical facilities in lieu of other ethnic populations. But from what my understanding is, this is kind of direct hatred or direct, uh, you know, statements against Asian Americans. It's direct hatred. And by the way, you know, the people perpetrating this hatred are not exclusively white. You know, we had, I'll give Mm. you a coast to coast example of, for example, our metro system. In the LA metro two weeks ago, we had an African American who walked up to, a woman, and, and, and basically said, you know, everything comes from China because they're effing disgusting, and, and, and looked right at her and said that. And, and then two days later, we had a victim who happened to be Asian American. She was wearing a mask in a New York subway station, and a man walked up to her and called her a disease B word. And so here we are, 3,000 miles apart in the same kind of transportation infrastructure where people are being challenged and threatened verbally. Uh, as they're just trying to go from point A to point B. What are you advising people that are experiencing these issues? You know, are you advising them to call the police? What should they do? Somebody who's an expert and a law enforcement professional, former law enforcement professional, what do you advise for these folks? Well, let me, let's work through two different scenarios. Most importantly, if the person is a victim, you know, my dad used to always say the best fight to have is the one you don't have to have. Uh, so I always tell people when they're confronted this way, they need to put some distance between them and the person that is doing, who is engaging them in this incident. Um, you know, if they happen to be in a pharmacy or if they happen to be in a grocery store, whether they've got a grocery full, you know, a cart full of groceries or not, they need to put some distance between them and the person. Uh, obviously the first thing to do is, you know, if you've got, identify your departure route, if you can take it, take it. The other thing I'm noticing when I've read about some of these incidents is these perpetrators tend to take people on that are alone. So I urge people, and this isn't always practical, but if you go to these places, you know, try to go with someone else. I I hardly have seen very many instances where more than one person has been affronted or attacked. That's one thing. Witnesses, again, if you're witnessing this, distance is always important. Whether you happen to be Asian American or the same demographic of the person being attacked, you know, consider your surroundings and and keep your distance. If it's safe, I suggest that if you're a witness, move closer to that victim because the person that's being assaulted verbally or physically, when someone moves closer to them, they feel a signal of support. And that's very critical. And I, I think that when a person sees who's assaulting someone, someone's moving closer to them to support them, they're going to, they're probably going to cease and desist. If it's safe, film the incident. And I know we live in this cell phone, you know, smartphone world where people try to film everything, but I see people trying to film incidents that really is putting themselves in harm's way. That is not a smart thing to do, but if they can film the incident, please do. And then last but not least, if you're a witness, follow up with the victim, make sure they're okay strongly recommend that they report 
and they should report these things because I got to tell you, there are instances in this country where the underreporting is just incredibly, just incredible numbers of underreporting. Essen, there are 20 cities last year in the, in the reporting period of 2018 to the FBI, 20 cities with populations of over 150,000 people that reported zero hate crimes. Yeah. Now, I know as a person who is steeped in expertise and experience in inequality and equity, you and I both know that that's not possible. Right. Absolutely. Uh, there were zero incidents reported in the entire state of Alabama and Wyoming. And then to make matters even more challenging, more than 16,000 law enforcement agencies reported zero hate crimes in 2018. So either we're not training our law enforcement officers to understand and recognize hate crimes when they happen, or they had cities where everybody loves each other. And I find that the latter is probably <laughs> not true. Yeah, that's, that's definitely not the case. I mean, sometimes people don't even know what they're experiencing is a hate crime. Exactly. Well, you know, it's as simple as this. If a person comes into a police department and says, you know, someone carved a swastika on the hood of my car, we shouldn't be writing that as a vandalism report. We should be writing that as a vandalism slash hate crime report. And I have the funny feeling and sneaky suspicion that's not happening. Right. And even on the prosecution side, I mean, now we're really getting into the weeds, Errol, but you and I know about this. I mean, even on the prosecution side, let's say it is a it is a hate crime. If there's any other perceived motive for yes. drawing that swastika, like, you know, I am pissed off at my neighbor for parking the car mm -hmm. and blocking my car. So I, this is why I did this. It's a mixed motive. It's an additional motive. It's very difficult to prosecute that as a hate crime. That's right. And so vandalism takes the top billing and usually the only billing and the hate crime component just disappears. You talked about if you're witnessing something happening. Let's say there's an Asian American person. You know, I was reading a story about an Asian American woman on the BART in San Francisco who experienced, you know, a couple of issues and is afraid to travel now on the BART. Mm -hmm. If you're a witness and you're witnessing something like that, you know, one of the things you said is that to keep a record or make a video or, or come close to offer support. What about, is it safe for the person to interject, you know, maybe distract the person, you know, say something like, does this train get off at, uh, uh, you know, in San Francisco or something like that? Is that, is that something that you would advise? Actually, yes, and that's a very good tactic. But again, what you don't want to do is be drawn into the situation to become a, a, a second victim, if you will. So, but that's a very good tactic because now the conversation has changed the focus of attention has changed, and that's a very good tactic. Let me tell you how bad it is. There are now Asian Americans that are wearing GoPro cameras on their baseball caps when they're out in public in case this happens so they can film it. Wow. That's what we've gotten to. That's where, we, that's where we are now. Based on what you're hearing from law enforcement colleagues, I mean, are they paying particular attention to this, or are they just so slammed with COVID-related stuff that this is not getting any billing? That's a very good question. I will say that for the law enforcement officers who happen to also be students in my class, we have discussed this. Uh, I haven't talked to any where they've actually taken reports of this happening. They're aware of it. I can tell you that we're paying particular attention to this at USC, and our Department of Public Safety is working with our Asian American students in particular to keep them safe and make them understand where to go, how to get there and to report these things if they happen. I can also tell you that I'll speak for the department of public safety and for LAPD. They do want to know where these things are happening so they can minimize and reduce the risk of it happening by then of course, having officers present in those locations more often than they might have before. But if they don't know where it happened, they can't be there. So reporting, again, is very, very critical. On that point, I wonder if there's like a direct page where people can go to report these incidents, or maybe they can just go to the general reporting website for the LAPD or, or DPS at USC. Well, there's a couple things. First of all, I ask people if they are already at home. Most importantly, if you're a student, we would love for you to talk to the Department of Public Safety at USC. That's, that's first of all. 
Uh, secondly, if you don't do it, they will do it, but make sure the city that you're in is also notified. So in this case, it would be the Los Angeles Police Department. Last, thirdly, the Asia Pacific Policy and Planning Council has an online site, and you can report there. Lastly, one other thing I want to mention to students, not just at USC, but across the country, we are one of many universities, probably all universities that have those blue light emergency phones on campus that nobody pays attention to because everybody has their own cell phone. If that ever happens where you are a victim and you're now troubled with trying to figure out how do I call 911, what's the non-emergency number for that agency, go to that phone, push that button, it rings down to the agency, you'll be talking to an officer immediately and you can report the incident. Uh, I'll speak for USC. Every That's great advice. Every every parking structure on our campus has one of these phones on every single level. You can't walk, I don't believe, more than maybe 50 yards on campus and not see one. It's just something we don't pay attention to because we all have our own phones. But we have them. They're everywhere. And every campus in America has them. So I urge people to use that. You'll see the same kinds of phones in our public transportation systems throughout most cities in America. Go to that phone, push that number, because sometimes, depending on what state you're in, if you dial 911, you may not get the agency of the city you're in. You know, in California, depending on where you are, you'll get the California Highway Patrol who will then have to forward you to the agency where you're located. So you could delay your call because now you haven't called the right place. So it's really important to know what number to call. And if you have those phones available, go to it, push that button. You'll be talking to an officer right away. I have one question. I'm going to step back just for one second, and then we'll move forward again. But sure. we talked about hate crimes briefly. Let's say it's it's not a hate crime. Is harassment of the kind that you've described and that we're seeing in the media, is it nonetheless a crime? It is nonetheless a crime. I mean, look, you know, an assault is, the present ability to do harm to someone. You don't have to touch a person to commit assault in the state of California. Right. So it's, you know, the intent with the present ability to hurt someone. So yes, it is as much a crime. And and I have to tell you, as soon as I'm afraid to go on the train because of what happened to me, if I'm afraid to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store, that's a huge problem. And so if we're talking about terrorism, which is based in fear, it's effectively been implemented at that point. So we are living in a social distanced world, right? Um, where, where communities, especially community support groups and organizations like Houses of Worship, mm-hmm. YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, etc., they're not operating. So these support Support networks are missing. People are not seeing their friends and family. That's missing. So do these social distancing rules overall make targeted communities more susceptible to additional targeting? They could be, yes, of course, because it's interesting you should ask that question. For the last six to eight months, our... Errol, I only ask interesting questions. You know this. (laughs) Excuse me. Um, For the last six to eight months, our State Communities Institute has been putting on a presentation called Homegrown Violent Extremism and Protecting Houses of Worship. And the reason we did that is because we have seen over the last year, internationally and here domestically, mosques, synagogues, and churches come under attack, violent attack, by terrorists and violent extremists around the world. If nothing else, that was a place of refuge, that was a place of comfort, that was a place of confidence. And I used to always say to myself before this started happening, you know, at least some things are sacred. Well, houses of worship are no longer sacred, not even to people who are violent. So now that we are socially distant, I can't go to that place once a week or reach out to my pastor or my rabbi or my imam or my priest to just have that conversation. So we are obviously seeing the age of virtual communication, virtual counseling, virtual services. And I think that it's to your point, it's making people feel more vulnerable because, you know, look, human beings are prone to and enjoy 
physical contact and physical interaction. And now that's been taken away even in their places of worship. So we're going to have to work doubly hard to make sure that A, people feel as connected as they did before, and B, when social distancing measures are reduced, they can return to these places and feel as safe as they did before. And they are certainly challenged as it relates to safety and security more now than they have been in history. So as a professor and as somebody who studied this issue, who's kind of advocated about this issue, what would you advise policymakers after the coronavirus pandemic has subsided? You know, what's the lesson we take away from this from a policy perspective? Well, the lesson we take away from this is a policy perspective is one, again, of tolerance. And more importantly, taking on these adversaries in a, the most progressive and effective prosecutorial way that we can. Look, Charlottesville in 2017 was a pivotal moment. We saw many right-wing radical groups that typically don't play well together in a sandbox coalesce that day under a common banner of hatred. And what has happened since then is because they were outed, because people were prosecuted, because some people who were outed were identified to their employers and they were terminated, we saw those movements back off from the public display we had in 2017 to a more covert role. I think that was very effective. And that was nothing more than Americans, and by the way, I'll remind everyone, the vast majority of us saying, we're not going to tolerate this. And organizations saying, that person's not going to work for me. So I think, legislatively speaking, we need to use the laws we have in place. And I'll remind people, there are more than 50 federal statutes that can be used to prosecute people for domestic terrorism. We don't need new laws. We need to basically enact the laws that are already there on the books and, and prosecute people to the fullest extent of the law. Second, there's an education and awareness process that has to take place. And I don't just mean with the average everyday citizen with regards to what kinds of threats are out there. You know, you and I both teach vast majority of the students we have in our courses at the State Community Institute are public safety officials and first responders. And we're always surprised when they don't know some of these organizations and individuals and groups and threats that are in their own backyard. So there's an education process that needs to take place on both sides. One, of the general public, and two, for those people who are protecting and serving the general public. You are viewing this, these kind of anti-Asian related to COVID, this discrimination, threats, assault, you're viewing this because there's an organizational perspective to it as domestic terrorism. Is that the lens you're viewing to view it? Absolutely. I'm viewing it as domestic terrorism. Um, I'm viewing it as a furtherance of their extremist ideologies, which, of course, fits the description for the definition. Uh, we've seen the uptick. It's not happenstance. And, and let's just face it. Let's go back to the conversation we had earlier on in the program. This is all based on the fact that we will be a minority-majority country by 2045. To these groups that are out there perpetuating these acts of harassment and violence, they see the word diversity as white genocide. It's an existential threat for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to the accelerationists that I described earlier, they've decided now the best defense is an offense, and they've gone on the offensive. Well, that's uh, both heartening and scary at the same time. Dr. Southers, thanks for joining us on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. A pleasure. And, and again, you know, I I long for a day, although it may not ever happen in my lifetime, when, you know, people like me and you with the expertise we have and experience we have are not as necessary as we are because right. you and I both know when put we me go out of work. the studio, yeah, put us out of work. But, you know, we go into a studio, I often hear people say, hey, we love having you on, but we know when you're on, something bad happened. And that's not a good feeling. Uh, so I would rather be out there talking about how this used to happen as opposed to what's going to happen next year. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. Fine. You know, I'm happy to change careers if the reason for doing that is 
that none of these issues are happening with people. You and me both. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of Unfair Nation. Our next guest is Nelson Schwartz, who wrote The Velvet Rope Economy. And that book talks about this creation of exclusivity in entertainment, in sports, and more troublingly, in areas like medicine, why certain people who have a lot of money can get physicians and medical care in a way that the rest of us can't, and what that means for our economy and what that means for our society. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe.